with John Mick Mullen, Johnny Mac, 97.3 ESPN Eagles Insider. Follow him on Twitter at JF McMullen. Johnny Mac, how you doing today? Doing well. How are you? Ah, I'm doing well. Doing well. So where do we start? Where would you like to start today, John? Because I heard Josh talking with you before he brought you on here on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline, and DJX has a little bit of a uh, a finger issue. Yeah, uh, broke his left ring finger, uh, I believe, at practice today. But I, I saw him in the locker room. You could not tell he broke his finger. He was in no distress whatsoever. Uh, but it has been confirmed he, he, he did break it. It's certainly not serious, and he's not going to miss any time. He's going to miss the preseason game, but every starter is going to miss that. He's expected back week one. Uh, broken finger is not a rare occurrence for receivers in this league. Right. How did it happen? You know, I have no idea. Yeah. We are kicked <laughs> out of practice this day. We're in regular season mode. So we get to watch uh, about the first 10 minutes of practice and a couple of individual drills. He certainly didn't do it then. So uh happens sometime during practice, but it, it's not serious. You just kind of report what happens and he broke his finger. So it's somewhat news, but I wouldn't be concerned. Right. All right. So d a little bit of a finger issue. Nothing that should scare any of us out there. He'll be ready to go uh, on week one as planned. Now there is a new addition today to the linebacker room. If you want to uh, transition into that. Yeah, well, I, I, you know, Hayes Pollard is one of those guys, a veteran, and, and you can see brought in. I've talked about this a lot in the past. This is, to me, the ugliest week on the NFL schedule for a lot of reasons, not only from an aesthetic standpoint, and that these week four games are just horrible uh, to watch, but uh, also from the standpoint that guys like this are brought in to get through the game. Why? So you don't have to play your regulars. So... Uh, I mean, this is not a significant move by any stretch of the imagination. This is a, we're not playing any of the linebackers that are supposed to make the team. So we need a body and Asante Brown who got waived was not able to practice. So he was dealing with some kind of issue. So probably wasn't going to be able to play. So they brought in uh, Hayes Puller today and he'll be gone on Saturday. And yeah. It's kind of an ugly, ugly way about doing business, but nobody seems to care. It's it's really wild when you think about it. That's what I was going to ask you if you weren't going to you know clarify that at the end. There is so he's just coming in literally for this one game because they need, as you put it a couple weeks ago, John, they need a crash test dummy. It, it, that it's just that simple. And after the game against the Jets, Pollard's gone just like that. Pretty much. Wow. Uh, I mean, uh, some of those. Uh... Uh, in, in this case, it's really because you don't even have a chance at the practice squad. I mean, there's a lot of guys who will play on, on Thursday that do have a chance to at least be brought back to the practice squad. But somebody who's here for 48 hours is not in that particular category. And we've seen it in the past. The Eagles have done it with some old Philadelphia Soul players. They brought in Jake Metz, if anybody remembers him, from the Soul two years in a row in situations like this to get through uh, the fourth preseason game. And, uh, hey, hey, look, uh, I'm not saying a lot of people took issue with crash test dummy. Uh, I could probably use better terminology uh, because these players, you know, from their standpoint, they want to do it. Uh, They certainly want to put on the uniform. In a lot of cases, I mean, Hayes has been an NFL player, so it's probably not as exciting uh, for him. But for some other people, it could be exciting just to wear the uniform. But again, I, 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 I have this tremendous disdain for this hypocrisy, and I've talked to many people who claim they're concerned about the safety of players. Well, they're concerned about the safety of the players they know. They should be about the safety of the players they don't care about. Right, they're protecting their assets. About this. Exactly. Yeah, it's really a crazy, it's a crazy conversation to get into and dissect because you, you feel like there is a lot of smoke and mirrors involved when the NFL side of the fence talks about safety and protecting their players and it's and coaches start talking about it in organizations and it's like well 
let's pump the brakes a second because I think this signing is a perfect example of the NFL and the individual organizations are in the business of protecting their assets, protecting their business assets, and the bottom half of each team can really go do whatever they want. Doesn't matter. That's what it seems like, at least. Yeah, and I, from the NFL standpoint, I mean, I I understand it from their standpoint. I understand what the Eagles are doing. I understand that they're doing exactly what you say, and and their uh, lip service towards safety is strictly related to uh, potential legal implications. That's what it's about. It's not about anything. I I kind of know that. I, that's not an issue for me uh, because you know they're not being above board. You know the foremost concern is not safety it's just uh uh, covering your you know what for that potential litigation uh more so i have a problem from and again it's always it's always a very small segment of the fan base it's always a minority but it's a very vocal minority that goes over the top and you've seen it really in the wake of andrew luck you you'll go online and you'll see these people just over the top. He's got to worry about his long term health. He's got to worry about his brain. He's got to worry about his future. He's smart. He can do a lot of things. But that's Andrew Luck. They don't care about the back end of these rosters who they don't know. So I I, I don't. If you don't want to use the word hypocrisy, I don't know what other word you can use. So when you talk about, you know, we started off the show just real quick on getting the the Sean Jackson update, very minor finger injury. He still looks like he'll be ready to go week one. But Doug Peterson did speak at the NovaCare Complex today. And, you know, you have a lot of good videos up on your Twitter page. Go check him out at JF McMullen on Twitter. But, you know, you have one of Doug talking about Fletcher Cox and the other long list of players that we have not yet seen in the preseason this year and are still coming back from injury from 2018. So what can you tell us, John, about Fletcher Cox and the rest of the crew that we have not yet seen and that we hope to see week one? Well, Doug keeps saying Fletcher's going to be there week one. We got a cameo from Fletcher in the locker room, but it was real quick. He said, I'll see you next week. (laughs) And (laughs) he was out. Um, and two weeks ago when I talked to him, he said he needed one week. That's all he needed to be ready for week one. So he's done nothing at practice. Uh, a lot of people, Ronald Darby, some of the other injured players, Ronald has worked his way back into team drills. Nigel Bradham has worked his way back into seven-on-seven. Seven. So you could see them at least trending in a positive direction, Brandon Brooks on the offensive side of the ball uh, has gotten back into individual drills. Uh, Derek Barnett uh, has worked in some team drills in practice. Fletcher's done none of that, none of it. And everybody says he's going to be there week one. And I'm not saying he's not uh, because he said, as, as I mentioned two weeks ago, all he wants is one week of preparation. But I, I got to tell you, I I can't imagine he would be the same Fletcher Cox we're used to. I can't imagine he could handle the same workload that we're used to, at least early in the season. I think there's going to be a ramp-up period. So if he is out there, I think he's going to be somewhat limited. I I mean, time is running out, and practice is over for this week, essentially. Uh, That was the last practice today. Then you have the game on Thursday. Cuts on Saturday, and then you start the regular season prep, and and that'll really ramp up on Wednesday with the with the biggest practice of the week. But you can see, not a lot of time for Fletcher Cox to go from zero to a hundred, and I I just can't see it. So I'm not saying he's not going to play, but I think if he does play, he's got to be scaled back. Right. Yeah. And that that's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. How do how do you anticipate Doug and the Philadelphia Eagles to handle all these players who are going to have to go from zero to 100 real quick? Are we going to see a lot of, you know, amped up substitutions at certain key areas like defensive line and possibly, you know, the secondary or anywhere else where you're saying, huh, 
we have this player here that's not going to not going to be able to go from zero to a hundred. And how are they going to protect these players and get them up to speed? Hopefully, you know, quicker than 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 a long month or you know a long first half of the season, whatever it may be. Yeah, I, I mean, Doug talked about that today as well, and he said they talked about it, and there is a plan because even if they are out there, and, and that's not just Fletcher, but that entire group I just named, uh, maybe you do have to think about uh, limiting their participation. I mean, typically, if Ronald Darby's healthy, he's out there for every play. Typically, If Nigel is healthy, Nigel Bradham, he's out there for every play. There's more of a rotational system uh, on the defensive line. Uh, But Fletcher generally plays 80% of the snaps. Um, And and Derek Barnett was certainly scheduled, at least on paper, to be ramped up uh, this season, play more uh, as the starting right defensive end. So you would figure – if he was completely healthy, he'd be in the 60, 65% range at least. And I don't know if that's realistic for guys who haven't done a whole heck of a lot in the summer. Now, the other three have done, as I mentioned, more than Fletcher. So maybe they're closer. But I can say Nigel was not, last time I talked to Nigel Bradham, he was not completely comfortable uh, he, he said he didn't have his explosion back from uh, the torn ligaments in his toes. So he was going to be sort of a, a always uh, a last-second decision when it came to week one. And Ronald Darby is back in team drills, but he's still got the brace on. He's not comfortable with the brace. He hates the brace. He wants to take it off. And it remains to be seen uh, when the Eagles medical staff clears him to do that. Uh, so I, there's questions surrounding all of those players, and not only if they play, but if they do play, how much will they play? Now I want to focus real quick on on Thursday's final preseason game, and I know you're saying, you know, thank goodness as much as anyone else is. I think everyone's ready to get the season started, but what are some storylines that are there any left? <laughs> what are some storylines for Thursday? I saw you tweeted out earlier, John, that – it doesn't seem like Josh McCown is going to play at all Thursday against the Jets, and he's still trying to learn the offense, although he didn't look too shabby uh, in in his first game with the Eagles. So what's the most compelling battle or storyline that you're going to keep an eye on, if at all, on Thursday? Well, uh, I mean, I got to talk to Carlton Agadosi. He's interesting. He's a Rutgers guy. He's from uh, Summer, Somerville, Somerton, New Jersey, one of those towns in, in central Jersey. So, uh, he's a local guy who's going to get to play in MetLife Stadium for the first time ever. So he's excited about that. Those are the kind of stories you see and maybe you get excited about. Talk to Alex Singleton, the former CFL star. This is his last push. I think he's proven to people he can play in the NFL. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be here because it's a numbers game. Uh, but I, I think he's got an opportunity to stay in the NFL. From the Eagles' standpoint, uh, maybe the most compelling question is who's going to be that fourth defensive end, uh, whether it's Deshaun Hall, Josh Sweat, Sharif Miller. Uh, Deshaun probably started behind both of those players and has certainly played better than the, than they have. And, oh, by the way, now Aaron Wilson from – uh, the Houston Chronicles saying Jadavian Clowney wants to play with the Seahawks or Eagles. So if Jadavian's here, none of that matters. But uh, I still think that's that's a big, big long shot. Well, yeah. Can, can you elaborate a little bit more on that? We talked a little bit about it yesterday, but everyone that I speak with, John, and I'm sure you're in a similar boat, it's Jay, it's it's Clowney. It's all about Clowney and what are the Eagles' realistic chances of acquiring him and what do you think is the best route that the Eagles could go down to possibly bring him in? Or like you just said, is that just really a far, far stretch of the imagination and it's it doesn't look like that could happen? Well, I, I think it's, it's sort of, you make up this term, the Howie Roseman percentage in the NFL. So <laughs> uh, the likelihood of where Jadavian ends up, I think 
most likely would be Miami uh, because of the relationship uh, with Bill O'Brien and Brian Flores. They're good friends. They seem to be steering in that direction. Uh, he supposedly wants to play for a contender. That's where Seattle comes in. Uh, that's where the Eagles come in. But uh, in that scenario, the Seahawks would be more likely because they have a bigger need uh, than the Eagles do. Remember, there's so many hurdles. I've explained all these numerous times. Not only you can't sign him to an extension because uh, he's under the franchise tag, so that deadline has passed. Uh, so that's a problem. He gets a lot of money. Uh, it's going to be $16 million. Uh, that's an issue. And the Eagles already have Brandon Graham, who they just paid, and Derek Barnett, who is uh, a, a recent first-round pick that you essentially moved Michael Bennett for, told Chris Long to retire to open up playing time. And now all of a sudden, I got news for you, if Clowney's here, one of them's not playing. And it's not – Brandon Graham. It's going to be Derek Barnett. Are the Eagles willing to do that? I don't think so. <laughs> you know, one interesting weapon that has gained more and more, you know, traction in conversations when talking about the Eagles and, you know, various depth charts, the wide receiver depth chart. And when you look at JJ Arcega Whiteside, you know, that him alone is part of the reason why the Clowney talks have maybe heightened a little bit. People are saying, well, you have our Sega white side here. You can trade away Alshon Jeffrey. You can trade away Nelson Aguilar. And, you know, we talked a little bit about that yesterday, but when you talk about our Sega white side's potential role and increasing minutes, maybe on the field as the season goes on, where do you, where and how do you see that playing out? Uh, I don't see it playing out unless, Someone gets injured, and that's why you have deaths. But there's not necessarily anything wrong with that. I, I think you know, as, as rumors go, there's more credible rumors. I, I just brought up Aaron Wilson. When, when Aaron says something, it's true. Uh, those Jeffrey rumors started from a, a website that is new and basically saw J.J. play in the third preseason game and said, oh, he's pretty good. Maybe the Eagles will trade all Sean Jeffrey. And as I explained, look, if you're a Super Bowl contender, the Eagles consider themselves a Super Bowl contender, uh, I think rightfully so. You don't trade away proven veteran players uh, to make room for rookies because they played well in the preseason game. And that's not a, a knock at, at J.J. because the Eagles are thrilled with his potential, but that's for next year. This year he's an insurance policy. And uh, they're not they're not trading all Sean Jeffrey. John McMullen joining us at 4 p.m. as he does every day, Monday to Friday. And it's becoming way too common, John, on Saturdays as well. The PT's got you working overtime on the Pete Thompson show on Saturday mornings. But John McMullen giving us all the news and notes on the Philadelphia Eagles every day here on the Sports Bash on 97.3 ESPN. Be sure to follow him on Twitter at JF McMullen. And, John, before I let you go, I replied to one of your tweets earlier today, and I wanted to bring it up and made sure I had an extra couple minutes for you. The Chappelle stand-up special on Netflix. I watched it last night, and I saw you tweet about it. Did you watch it last night as well? Uh, I watched it yesterday, I think during the day, not at night, but, uh, nonetheless, yeah, it was phenomenal. I, I expect it to be phenomenal because that's a guy who has mastered his craft, but I also, uh, marvel at his fearlessness, as I said, just being able to take on the people because everybody's scared of their own shadow because everybody's so upset. And I just love the point where Dave... Dave doesn't do impressions, so he did two impressions. And, and one of them was an impression of the audience, and they didn't realize it. Yeah. I thought it was just great. He's brilliant, man. You you don't know maybe where he's going for the – at least me. I'm not as intelligent maybe as you are. But for the first five or ten seconds, and then he pieces it all together. He'll piece, you know, circle back on jokes 40 minutes into the special. And, you know, he's able to kind of criticize and shed light on what's becoming – touchy subjects on everything and and kind of 
criticize but also compliment in the same manner. I don't know. I, I just thought it was absolutely brilliant. Yeah, and and there's also a Jerry Seinfeld's show, Comedians in Cars, yes. and Getting Coffee is also on Netflix now. And uh, he did one show with Chappelle, and they both talked about that. And, and they're both kind of fearless in different ways. Uh, and they both, in, in true comedians, will always do this. I mean, you talk about the, I mean, he was taking on everything, the alphabet yep, people, yep. which you'll laugh about that, but they'll also talk. You know, he's defending Michael Jackson in a very funny way, <laughs> yeah. uh, which is tough to do. Uh, right. And, that, and, that's Yeah, he, he makes it so easy on very, tough, you know, like I said, touchy, difficult subjects where he's able to just make it, you know, just like a, any conversation at the bar with your friends and you end up, you know, cracking up. Yeah, which he can't do now. And, and his defense of his friend, Louis C.K., is also a brilliant comedian who died as he put it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh man. If you missed it, be sure to check it out on Netflix. John and I with a five minute plug on the Chappelle stand up and be sure to check out John McMullen on our 97.3 ESPN YouTube channel. If you missed any of the interviews or want to listen to him again, John, thanks as always, man. All right. Thanks Ryan. No problem.